Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us uh, for this fourth of the sustainability sessions of this year's JEC. And this one is focused on the four R's uh, for composites in a circular economy. The four R's being repair, reuse, repurpose, and recycle. Um, I'm sure that uh, many of you here will be aware that uh, you know, climate change is a matter of growing concern. There's been news just this week about concern about rising sea temperatures as being an indication of possible acceleration of climate change. So the need for action has never been stronger. And that's true for the composites world as it is for every other industry. And you know, true sustainability is going to need both decarbonization, we understand that very clearly, I think, but it's also going to need circularity. Uh, and for the composites industry, decarbonization is something we feel very comfortable with because composites are contributing significantly to reducing carbon emissions. But circularity is a bigger challenge. The things that make composites really good materials, durability and strength, long life, mean that actually dealing with them at end of life is a bit much bigger challenge. It's, it's much more complex. Um, and there's a lot more to do. And that's what we're going to be exploring in, in our session today. How can we deal with and make best use of composite materials when they reach the end of a service life and we want to do something positive with them? And I hope that uh, through the conversation we're going to have today, you will all learn a lot about the different techniques and options that are available, uh, the expertise that's being developed, and the opportunities that you can take away and start to use. Uh, let me introduce myself first before I introduce the panel. So my name is Malcolm Forsyth. I am the Sustainability Manager for the Composites UK Trade Association, who represent the composites industry in the UK. Uh, we're a, a member of the European Composites Industry Association as well, very much working uh, across Europe. So uh, I'm going to be moderating the session. I'm going to be trying to use our panel of speakers to get the maximum value for you uh, in terms of information about the, the different aspects of this particular topic. Uh, I'm going to ask each of the panel members now to introduce themselves briefly, to say who they are, where they're from, and their particular area of interest and expertise on this topic. So, Tim, over to you first. Yeah, thank you very much. So, hello, everybody. So, um, my name is Tim Rademacher. I'm the general manager for Composite Materials in the EMEA region for Mitsubishi Chemical Group. Uh, so, we are taking care about recycling in an industrial way. So, I'm for more than 15 years right now in waste disposal management. So, we started the recycling of carbon fiber composite materials in 2011. Now, I'm happy to be here having this discussion to show where we are looking for new questions. So this is a job and the discussion about. Thank you very much. And next, Stefan. Hi, um, I'm Stefan Zaber. I'm working at EDAC Engineering. Um, I'm part of the innovations department. Um, what my job is to turn vehicles greener. And one of the things I do to do that is to have reusable and durable components made of CFRP um, that can um, last longer than the life of a vehicle. John, over to you. John Bussell, Vice President of the Composites Growth Initiative with the American Composites Manufacturers Association. I've been involved with uh, educating our industry on sustainability and specifically recycling, uh, being involved with various products, been doing this for about 15 years. So this is not like something new but we're getting to a nice uh, uh, precipice of taking a big step uh, and making our industry more relevant. So that's what I do. That's great. Nicola, introduce yourself. Good afternoon. Uh, Nicholas Darian, the co-founder and CEO of Continuum. Uh, we have developed a mechanical transformation technology to handle end of life blades and other composite products and transform them into high value panels for the construction industry. Thank you. Raphael. Yes, good afternoon. Raphael Plenet, I'm the managing director of ECIA, which is the European Composite Association, Industry Association. And we represent national associations and also uh, sectorial organizations. 
And one of the goals of our association is really to help all the members and the composite industry to address the challenge on sustainability and then circularity of composite materials. We have developed some tools for that and uh, also we have a, a wide scope of the different solutions, existing and the tomorrow solutions. And uh, Amael, oh, looks like we have another mic. It's just been found. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, so my name is Amael Kohad. I'm CEO and co-founder of Compare Technologies at Compare. We have developed a uh, self-healing composite. So we provide pre-pregs onto the market to build composites that are healable, that last longer and produce less waste. And looking forward to the panel also to bring the sustainability aspect throughout reuse, a repair, and how can we extend the lifetime of those structures before getting to the, the end of life and uh, having the full circularity. That's great. So I hope you can see that we've assembled you know, a panel with a, a wide pers set of sp perspectives, um, both in terms of technologies, but also in terms of the geographies and the regional experience that they're going to be bringing. And I hope we'll be able to bring out a lot of that in, in the conversation. The format we'll be following will be, I'll be asking questions and I'll point them towards specific individuals. Um, but the aim is to start a conversation. And I expect that other panel members then will, you know, will say, actually, I've got something I want to add on, on that. And hopefully in doing that, we'll bring out a lot of information. We'll also perhaps highlight that you know, there is no one agreed view on this. There's lots of different perspectives. There's no one solution. And there will be differences of opinion between our panel members. We've already been having quite an active conversation in the back room beforehand, which I think has highlighted, you know, there are different views. And we're going to try and bring out some of those. And we want to hear your voice as well. So if, some, if someone says something you think, I'd really like to know more about that, or I don't agree with that, please be ready to ask, to ask a question later on. There will be a Q&A opportunity. Uh, we hope to allow a good 10 to 15 minutes at the end for that. So, you know, capture your questions and then have the courage to ask them later. And hopefully we can, you know, give you a, a helpful answer to the questions that you raise. So that's the format. Uh, let's get going. So I've, I've got a set of questions I'm going to be asking. So first of all, we're going to look at the different levels of hierarchy and think about, you know, extending life through repair, think about reuse, think about recycling. And I'll be asking different panel members to, uh, to, to answer those. So first of all, a question for, uh, for Nicholas and for Stefan, really around reuse. Um, and just to open up the conversation, what do you see as the potential opportunities for reusing composite materials in new applications? And what are the challenges associated with that? So maybe Nicholas, you could start us off and then I'll, I'll hand over to, to Stefan to pick it up from there. Thank you. Um, so w when I look at the opportunities, I, I think of recycling first and foremost, it's what we do, uh, and fiberglass is what we focus on. Um, absolutely lifetime extension, uh, repair, repurposing plays a critical role. But at some point, all composites will reach the end of their first life and will need to be recycled. Um, and within, within recycling, I see mechanical recycling in order to be able to turn these waste products into new products as the real opportunity. Um, and I think that's when we talk to, to our stakeholders, that's a view that's commonly shared. Um, the issue with, with the other types of technologies um, that try to reclaim fibers, the way we see that, or, or, or resins, is that um, one, they're not sustainable, but assume that they're sustainable uh, and that's viable. First, when you look at the true circularity or the true, the true recycling rate of these technologies, it can be quite low, right? So that means that a lot of the materials actually gets wasted and never put back into the circular economy. Um, the other issue is that the quality of the fibers uh, of, of the resins can also be quite low and expensive versus virgin material, which makes for a very difficult business model, ultimately. And so, you know, we, we have a, a mechanical technology that obviously I think is, is pretty great. Um, but one of the values is that we can create from these waste materials a really high value, high performing end product that can compete in very large markets. And do you want to share a bit about, you mentioned the challenge of economics. Yeah. 
You know, are there any other challenges you want to highlight that uh, we need to find ways through or over? Well, there's there's the challenge of the economics, of course. Uh, at the end, any solution has to be a commercially viable business. Um, otherwise, you can't fund and, and, and start these things. Um, the challenge is, uh, as I said, around the reclamation, when you start to look at the real footprint of um, certain solutions, it, it's also less attractive than it might seem. Uh, so um, you, you always have a, a technical challenge first to get it to scale and uh, combine that maybe with a, a sustainable sustainability challenge. And then you have a commercial challenge to somehow make it work uh, at scale. Okay, that's great, thank you. And Stefan, do you want to give a perspective, particularly about reuse, because that's the area that you're particularly focused in? Yeah, um, so my experience is really that uh, reuse itself is today not really an existing business model. So what I can talk about now is where I see the best chances, and that's where we already have something like a circular business model. So where you maybe do not buy the product, but you rent it maybe. So this is for us in the mobility industry, for us it's fleets, car fleets or transporter fleets. Um, this is where it may pay out. And um, on the other end, like sporting goods, um, they can also rent some sporting goods, in particular those with carbon fibers like skis um, or anything else, so, uh, golf equipment as an example. Um, and this is where we think reuse is the best, um, has the best opportunity because there it's always in professional hands. So the end user probably won't bring back the product to reuse it at the end. So we still need to have some organization with an eye on the product during the lifetime. And that's where I would say in existing circular business models, there's also an additional business model for circular um, composites. Okay, that's great. And I think you've highlighted there some of the important, you know, we need to look at business models in a different way uh, to help to drive some of this circularity more, move away from kind of the conventional ownership model, maybe to more of a, a lease and return, which will drive then reuse of materials and greater incorporation going forward. Now, just, just to pick up on that sporting goods, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move now to the question of repair. And I wanted to, to bring in Amiel at this stage and hear a little bit more about your repair technology and some of the markets maybe where it's, there's opportunity and some of the challenges that you've seen around re the repairability of composites. So over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I think this really joins Stefan as well of what you said behind the repair. And uh, before when we were discussing together before the panel, we mentioned a lot about, uh, about education. And I think this is important to think, in, to think it also in another way of uh, what is the business case behind? How can we build the business case and into the sporting goods, so for all the applications where we have composites, we can bring the repair. We bring the repair, people know that this is a challenge, and I have to say that with all the commercial actors that we are uh, either implementing our products or in discussion for implementation, this is always the same case. Yes, we have troubles of repair, and then when we ask the question, how much does it cost, no one knows, because they are not quantifying it because they didn't have the right solutions before. So there is a part of education behind that and this is the expertise of our company as well to bring this uh, a value case to work with the customer in order to quantify all that. And so we can go into the entire composites industry. Uh, we are somehow focusing because we have limited resources uh, currently. The, the company is relatively young, even though it's growing really fast. Uh, and we like to call it a step zero for us into the sporting goods. You mentioned it before, um, the sporting goods uh, manufacturers and, uh, are going fast also into their implementation, so, uh, so we can go there, have the, the value cases that are well demonstrated, but then uh, this is only the first step. We need to go broad into the industry, and, uh, and I think the mention around uh, being in the hand of the manufacturer is really important because uh, it's not the end user, it's not the guy who, is, who will use the ski, who will directly uh, directly repair. For some cases, yes, it can, but uh, the most important thing is to have the OEM behind, to have the, to have the manufacturer that will see an economic uh, value behind that, because that's always a game 
and we need to be transparent on that. That's always a game between the economic value and the sustainability. And the sustainability is one thing, we are bringing it, but we need also to, to have the economic value behind. And if the manufacturer is included into there, this will work. And the rental business is really important, but even without a rental business, there can be always uh, some maintenance. We like to call repair regeneration of part, and so we can totally imagine for many of the application, we don't know necessarily if there is a damage, but most probably there is one, and just with a one minute repair, you bring it to maintenance services, and you extend the lifetime in that way. Okay, that's great. So uh, that's given a little insight, I hope, into the whole sort of repair of, of composites opportunity. And I think what we've begun to see already is, you know, there's a technical aspect to this, but there's a really important commercial and business model aspect to driving some of these opportunities further forward. And we need to move from a sell and forget type of uh, approach to a much more one of ownership down the chain and recovery and return uh, if we're going to move towards a much more circular economy. Um, I don't know if Raphael, do you want to add anything you know, in terms of how you see these opportunities for extending the life cycle and, and the service life of products before we move on to talk a bit more about recycling? No, I Thank you. Now, at RCR, we also support the idea to extend life of uh, composite material. And what has been said is already online. We today are more concentrated on the, the end of life solutions, but of course, all has to be done upstream is, is necessary. So we are full support on these uh, different solutions, but I think it's not where is the, the main focus uh, at the moment. Yeah. Okay, and it's just a reminder really that you know, all levels of the hierarchy are gonna be important. Extending life at the beginning, reuse, repurposing, recycling, and, and the repair as part of extension of life are all gonna play a part. I wanna move on to talk a bit about recycling now because that I think is a topic that a lot of people in the audience are probably very aware of oh, and are interested to hear more about. So perhaps if um, we could so think about the, the recycling and, and uh, Tim, if you could maybe share some examples from your experience, you've been involved in the recycling of carbon fiber composites now for many years. So. You know, give some examples of successful recycling where you think it's worked really well and, and the potential for further scaling up of carbon fiber recycling. So give us some of those perspectives. Yeah, as you said, thank you very much. So this is really important to see where we are coming from because um, normally this waste disposal service was totally separated and independent from producing a reclaimed material. So now we have a big change and uh, I guess everybody is being used to use the word of recycling as a sustainable, as a good thing. But a couple of years before, recycling was connected of bad quality, cheap material, and don't know what to do with it. So um, having this in background right now, we have this change like coming from a waste disposal service uh, business where you're collecting materials is now for our understanding the raw material of the future. And even during the last three years, it's an additional supply security. So a total change, we know it from battery recycling right now, many things are coming up to recycle, black mass, for example. So it's a valuable material. This is good because it's a big change in our heads and the understanding of the need of talking about sustainability. But still, we need to deal with the situation that we are working on a service provider and on a production side. This needs to be aligned, this needs to be combined. And this is a little bit the history where we came from. So starting to collect waste, doesn't care, doesn't matter if it is an end-of-life material, if it is destroyed, so to say, with other materials like waste, carbon fiber composites and rotor blade, everybody can imagine, is coming up with foam, wooden structures, aluminum, metal parts. So it is like this. So there is never ever a clean material as everybody expected. So we need to deal with the waste like it is. And then we need to understand what is the purpose, how we need to reclaim the fiber. So it means we need to have a look at the further end even on the OEM side, to understand now how can we fulfill the gap, the process in the most efficient way and in the most valuable way for the customer-orientated market. And this is, I would say, um, an ongoing process to have this proper understanding that we need to change our mind, our mindset, and even the industry and the businesses will change because this is a close work together of a service provider and a producer of a material. 
Okay, that's great. And I think you highlighted there one of the emerging challenges, which is the, the availability of virgin raw materials. I think everyone who's a manufacturer in this room will know that the last three to five years have been really quite challenging getting hold of virgin raw materials, whether that's fibers or resins, and that isn't going to get easier going forward. And yet we have vast volumes of end of life or processing waste material, which is a ready source of raw material. And we need to be much more smart, really, about how we use that so that we get that material brought back into effective use. And there's a lot of thought being given about how do we move from very long, uh, quite fragile supply chains to much more regional ones, reshoring, bringing and using material we've already got in the form of, of waste products and, and gaining the value from them. So that's something I want to try and explore a little bit more uh, in the course of the conversation uh, with the panel. But hopefully we've, we've introduced some of the themes. What I want to do now is, is ask John and, and Raphael to talk a little bit about some of the regional kind of perspectives on this. So I'm going to ask John, first of all, if you could give an overview you know, from the US side um, of the current state of composite material recycling and the challenges that need to be addressed to increase the circularity of the composite sector. So, John, give us a US view. Three words, uh, evolving, complicated, and innovative. So, 15 years ago, um, recycling of composites was there. There was a method called mechanical recycling, grind it up, and no one ever knew what to do with it. So over the course of that time, in various forms, there's been innovations in thermal uh, applications as well as chemical applications. So now we have three different processes. And what has evolved is now a, a, a whole family, at least when we were putting together a grid of recycling facilities in the United States, it came to my surprise that there are 15. Uh, that didn't exist 15 years ago. But not everybody does the same thing. So there's the complication. Uh, they don't all recycle the same way. They also don't like to take all the same waste. So the waste may be cured composites, it may be pre-preg, it may be B-stage, it may be dry fiber, or a combination of all of that. Some firms like carbon fiber, some firms like glass fiber, very few do carbon and glass fiber. And then what results in all of that could be milled fiber, chopped fiber, uh, various other fabricated panels. So it becomes immediately complicated. But the, the process is that it's always evolving and there's always innovation. So when we talk about composites, and how it's being recycled and we're gonna to go to a particular firm, don't expect them to be able to solve your problem. You're gonna to have to do a little research. So we try to do that, at least in the United States, if you go to our, our ACMA home website, there's a recycling spotlight section on the main page. And you can go to that grid and you can see exactly what that complication is, which is good. It's a, it's a roadmap. So, that's what has evolved, and that was astounding to me, but the innovation is now taking place. The secret sauce is the business case. So we all want to know what to do with the recyclet at the end. Is it going to be a value in its final product? And that's where more innovation is going to take place. Great. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think you've introduced there uh, one of the the themes that will come through, which is, you know, we need applications, we need demand for recycled materials. That's what will drive the business development of these circular solutions. Um, and so one of the challenges for you as an audience is to think about what recycled materials could I use? Where could I use them? Which applications would be a good fit? Because everyone in this room will have, I think, some influence over how materials are chosen. And we would really encourage you to be thinking about where can you use recycled materials? Because we need the demand to grow to pull through the business case for many of these solutions. 
Raphael, do you want to give a, a European perspective on that uh, question as well, just about how it's developed and what are the current status and the current challenges? Thank you, of course. Uh, and uh, thank you, John, because, of course, there is similarities between the US and Europe, and we are working together to address it. So the first comment is we are convinced that we can succeed only if we work as a team and a global team. And this is one because we are sharing best practice. Now, in Europe, just a, a short example. Uh, recently, the GRC, the Joint Research Center from the uh, European Commission, has recognized that composite materials are recycled materials. So that's a, that's a statement. There is something still we need to discuss with, uh, with the Commission, which we do at uh, ECIA on, on that. Um, we recognize that there is long-term vision, and we also, uh, thanks to the input of ACMA, we made a, a grid of the different type of recycling solutions in Europe. There is existing, and there is some projects. So you have, which is a good news, a good dynamic on the market today for a lot of innovation, and I, I share this. You, you have uh, startups, you have new ideas coming, uh, and so the, the, the industry and uh, innovation is there. So that's a, a good... Uh, a good for the future, the short-term future. At, now, shortly at OCR, we worked with uh, on, a, on a specific technology which is called cement co-processing. It's how to recycle, in fact, uh, go with, to treat the, the waste uh, composite material into the cement kiln. In fact, the waste, uh, the composite material is made, made of glass and resin. The glass is one of the raw material of the cement and the resin is what they call alternative fuel. So it's one solution. It's maybe not the, the ideal one, but it works today to address the problem. So we have demonstrated, and, it, and it's working. The good part of it is that the logistic around Europe is existing, because it's also something to address. You know, we are talking about waste material, but then we need to move. Where do, what do you do with a wind blade? You know, how to move it? So uh, before you have to install new capacities, which major investment, because you were talking about the economics, you know, we also need to be on reality. And what the role of, of UCR is to bring immediate solutions which are realistic, because very shortly we, you, you will talk about what's the cost to treat it, okay? So that's, um, I can go a little bit deeper, but I think yeah, I think that's, that's hopefully introduced, you know, that some of the current status in Europe and America, and it's very much a dynamic situation. There are technologies today, but there's a lot of innovation of technologies which will play a big role in the future. Uh, and today's technologies won't necessarily be the solution in five to ten years' time. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, maybe ask each of the panelists to, to give us uh, some examples they want to highlight, which are really good example of so whether it's a reuse or a recycle or a repurposing sort of application. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll actually start, I think, at, with Amael, with repairing. If you can just give us one or two examples so people get a feel for you know, what composite applications can be repaired and you know, what's the sort of state of technology today uh, for doing that. So give us some examples of things you're involved with where you've got repairable composites. Too many examples. Where to well, start? Give, give me one or two. <laughs> no, one thing, one thing, so maybe we need to differentiate between monolithic composites where we have uh, like two mils to, to up 10, 20 millimeters thick composites where, where you have micro cracking into there due to fatigue, due to impact, uh, where the repair uh, needs to be there in order to avoid further growth and catastrophic failure. In, in terms of repair, if we break the, the part into two, we cannot do anything, that's for sure. So um, in, in such types of applications, what we have seen, and typically the example of the skis that we have seen before, uh, is one thing that we are doing well, that we have started uh, quite early into that. But then uh, the, there are the applications around aeronautics as well. Uh, on our booth, we have one part uh, that is a wheel cover, uh, and into such kind of wheel covers, you have a lot of impact damage into there. Um, and actually, the people that we're working with on that are changing too many times the wheel covers. So in there, we can just regenerate those, those wheel covers and avoid the waste into there. Then there are all the sandwiches as well. These are types of applications that we do, and I, I really like the, one of the cases that we have, we have presented quite early on uh, at Compare. 
was the one from a, a nautical manufacturer uh, where they have panels, uh, foam panels, where, where you have the skins that are made out of composites. And actually, the problem is that if you make a dent into the panel, then you see it into the application. And, and that's a problem already at the manufacturing stage. So the people that are building the, the, the boats already at the manufacturing, they, they damage uh, uh, their parts and they cannot deliver that to the, to the customer. So in average, uh, uh, this customer was spending uh, two days for a repair because you need to uh, get the repair and then this is painted, painted so you need to repaint it again. Uh, and instead of two days, it was two minutes with our solution. There is the foam, so it takes a bit more time to heat as well. Uh, but it's a really nice case where we see that such kind of, uh, of panels can be repair, repaired really easily and we have compatible paints as well that goes with that. And then this opens the floor for not only this kind of applications of panels within the nautical domain, but then this opens that for, for tooling, for all types of uh, mobility, application, uh, mobility applications where you have all those panels that are damaged every time. And if you don't do anything at one point, they just break and you can replace it. Okay, it's great. So I hope that's given you some idea of the, the scale of repairability that, that's available. And, and I'm sure that uh, Amaya will be very happy to talk to you on his booth if you wanted to find out more about that. So that's repair. Let's move to Stefan and just talk about reuse. Can you give us some examples of you know, cases that you've been involved in showing the, the potential for, for reuse of composites uh, going forward? Yeah, we developed some uh, use cases for that. Um, so for us, we, are, we worked on the structures you do not see. And your structures were visible, and there your solution is really good because you do not have to remove the paint. And our solution, I think, is better for the, um, for the parts you do not see. So the structural parts behind the surface, um, first that's um, the body in white, or huge parts of the body in white, so they have to be quite big. So they have a value, a high value. The bigger they are, the higher the value. Um, so that's where we think this is comfortable, but you always have to keep in mind the design of the vehicle must be different for that. So the entire vehicle must be, must be changed. We need a modular design. We have to consider that the joining must be totally different because you have to get the part out of the vehicle after first life cycle. So this means, um, Joining technologies like screws are maybe a bit strange for, um, to promote them for, for composites. That's why we tried to introduce um, um, yeah, adhesive connections which can be detached. And we worked on that and we found out it's not that bad. It's working quite well. And it's also one, one solution is to mix expandable particles into the adhesive which are expanding at a temperature of about 120 degrees, and the strength of the adhesive is decreased by far, and then you can remove the part. And this creates um, a solution This is maybe also comfortable to what you do, because in the one step, you can heat up the part, you can get it out of the vehicle, but on the other hand, if we were using your resin, this could also turn this into a repaired, already repaired uh, part. So if there was a smaller damage you do not see, then you just, setting, resetting the part. This could be very, very cool. Okay, that's great. And I think you very helpfully introduced another really important concept, which is design for circularity. So actually designing parts which allow easy dismantling, easy removal for that part then to be repaired or reused elsewhere. And actually, traditionally, that's not been at the forefront of people's thinking. Needs to be much more going forward that parts and whole assemblies are designed with circularity in mind and with life extension, life replacement, etc., uh, taken into account. So thank you for introducing that in really important point. So Nicholas, just moving to you and, and your uh, particular focus, can you give us some examples of you know, how you're seeing through your process, you know, composite waste material being converted into valuable end product and some of the applications where that's possible. Yeah, conveniently I can. And, and conveniently, I also brought a panel here. So and this is a, a panel that we can produce. Um, 
just a few weeks ago, it was a Vesta's V47 blade sitting somewhere in Denmark. And it's made from over 90% composite material. Um, we, we reclaim essentially everything from a blade, uh, except for the metals, which we give out to somebody that can do something better than we can with them, uh, and, and put the, the reclaimed materials back into these panel products. And these are products that can be used in high-end applications like facades, like kitchen countertops, bathroom elements. Um, I think one of the keys is that we're going into existing markets and large existing markets. Um, we're not trying to create a new market. And we're also doing it with a, pan, with a panel or a product that can be worked and, and handled in the same way that these existing products can be handled. So we're not changing behaviors here. You can take this panel and you can bevel it and sand it and paint it and veneer it, anything that you can do with a traditional panel. Um, uh, and that's, that's very important. And the other thing is that, yeah, we're going into these large markets. So it's, the construction industry obviously is huge and sustainability is a very big topic for the industry as well. So, you know, in, if in Europe alone you have millions of square meters of buildings that need to be renovated in the coming years, not, not 30 years, but in the coming few years, uh, and facades contribute a huge amount of CO2 to the footprint of a building. And so our panels can help them lower that footprint. Um, and we're working with, with really you know, reputable companies to be able to bring these products into the market. And we have, you know, we're, we're working on the certifications, we have the performance requirements, we're working on the LCAs and the environmental product descriptions um, so that this is actually a, a, a viable product. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And thank you for bringing in examples so people can see that it's tangible, it's real, it's not just a concept. Actually, there is a product that people you know, can be using today with a whole range of specific benefits. Uh, Tim, can I come to you and ask you to talk about, from a, a recycled carbon fiber point of view, just some examples of how recycled carbon fiber is now being used you know, successfully in, in, in different markets and applications. Yeah, for sure. So first of all, we probably see it as Mitsubishi Chemical Group a little bit from a different perspective. As a raw material supplier of virgin carbon fiber, um, we need to think about closing the loop at the end, for sure. Because everybody knows uh, the virgin carbon fiber production so far is consuming a lot of carbon dioxide footprint. So it means we need to have a look at the whole process chain. We call it, we implemented it uh, with the Japanese word, it's called kaiteki. So it means um, we want to take care um, what can we take out of scrap, making the most valuable material out of it? And um, this was actually the story why we shift from the typical waste disposal service to a producer of reclaimed carbon fiber material. Means, and practical, um, so first of all, uh, we can reclaim the fiber, we can bring them on a certain length. And now there's one discussion ongoing, it's just a downgrading. So this is normally the word, um, also, it's around the market. It's a downsizing for sure. We cannot produce an endless carbon fiber out of a short carbon fiber. There are techniques available, so it's not that it is not possible, but technically you will even see some application on this uh, exhibition here. So means, first of all, we need to have in mind that there is an existing market for a short carbon fiber available, and these are massive volumes we can substitute by using an already short carbon fiber. So it means there's a need to substitute the virgin production because nowadays it will be produced and then chopped. So, but the reclaimed carbon fiber, which may be available until a length of 100 millimeters, is a good approach to save this virgin production. Internally, we can then convert it into different intermediates. So we can convert the short carbon fiber into a textile process. And this textile process is a starting point to do the pre pregging or also to introduce it to the SMT, to the sheet molding compounding. So, and then the next step needs to be done, application. So, a couple of years before, it was all about, like, do we find application for reclaimed carbon fiber material? Yes, we have them internally, and we even go further in this process chain. We can produce parts, and we can produce parts which are ready for application together with ADAC, actually, 
you can see on our booth in Hall 6, uh, booth 50, the battery case, which is produced with a variety of intermediate materials in-house and combined with recycled carbon fiber materials. And the purpose was that you won't see it. It's there. It's working. It's not a point of discussion, what can we do? It's already existing and it's somehow interfered in between. So, and this is why we say right now, we solved this point, we can close the loop at all. Now we are actually focusing at the next, you also ask for the next challenge. The challenge is to think about proper take back systems because this is the next step is every, everything is implemented and we heard it also from overseas that the recycling technology is there. We know how to reuse. Now we need to focus on a closed loop take back system in different industries, on different sections, different materials, and different, let's say, materials wise like end of life, pre prec intermediates, and so on. And this is our challenge or our ongoing uh, topic of today. That's great. And just another reminder, really, about business models. You know, we need to look at the how we operate in a different way if we're going to really help to drive up demand and usage of abundant raw materials in many cases in, in recycled. I want to change tack a little bit for, for John and Raphael, ask a bit about how do we build awareness and how do we educate or how do we best educate uh, you know, the market about circularity and about recycling and reuse and repair. So maybe you can give us a, a, a quick perspective on that and then I'll just give the audience a, a little heads up that we do want to hear from you. So do get your questions ready and then we'll have somebody with a roving mic to come and uh, hear your question and put it to the panel. Before we do that, let's, um, let's hear a little bit about education and, re and awareness building in the wider market. So I don't know, John or Raphael, do you want to go first? And then, and then John will, will pick up from there. So one of the, the things to, um, we need to measure what we are doing, okay? Because sustainability is also how do you progress? Because I like all the discussion, we have again the confirmation there is solutions. Uh, at OCA, we have developed an eco impact calculator, which goes from cradle to gate. So it means in a, in a few, two minutes, you can have the CO2 footprint of, your produ uh, of, the, of the production of your composite part material. So that's one point, you know, how to demonstrate and how to measure where you are and where you would like to go. So that's, uh, that's one thing. The second where uh, we, I said that at the beginning, we are totally convinced that we will succeed uh, on this if we create a large alliance and a working team together. So we call for an alliance of the different stakeholders around the supply chain, from raw material suppliers to the end users. How can we address this sustainability challenge? So that's also here we are, we are really developing these actions. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Raphael. And, and John, do you want to give a perspective from, uh, from North America? So I go back to what I said earlier. It's all about education. And it's taking a lot. Sustainability is a lot of syllables. And it takes a lot for somebody to understand its true uh, penetration, its true impact. You know, and you were talking about design for sustainability. We have a hard time explaining composites to design when it's virgin materials. Now we're going to say design for sustainability. That's, that's tough. That's really tough. Uh, part of it is we spend an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out how to bond things together so that they never come apart. Now we have to figure out how to separate that. So, you know, that's a challenge. That's a chemistry problem. And so we have to figure out that chemistry. Um, what this is all going to come back down to is developing the standards. Uh, those standards that qualify what the products are that, are that are being recycled and where they're going into. So the things that are happening in the United States is right now there's a lot of talk about plastics and specifically single-use plastics and they're joining composites with single-use plastics. So there's a lot of education even from the lawmakers to say, whoa, 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 stop, 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 stop. We're different, and we're different how. So it's educating lawmakers, policymakers, and those regulatory units 
as well as the industry. So it gets quite complicated. Uh, again, you know, composites are complicated, but that's going to be the challenge. Um, and that's not going to happen next year. It's going to happen over the next 10 years. I mean, it's, it's going to evolve. But so uh, we're working with regulatory uh, federal agencies, uh, legislators, to make sure that they don't shortchange composites to begin with. And then we're working with development of product category rules and eventually working with our members to make environmental product declarations. And these are all new words, new terms, new acronyms that we have to then educate why do we need to do this? So when you were talking about with buildings, um, I remember having discussions with architects five, 10 years ago and they're all concerned about lead points. And now they want to know about, so what's your environmental product declaration on that panel so I can put it on this building? Well, we don't have that yet. Well, it's in process. It's being worked on, but we don't have that yet. So who's the competition? Steel, aluminum, concrete. So we have to do some catching up. Thank you. And I think that's... That's an important reflection for the industry as a whole, that you know, we're, we're up against some big players, other materials, they've probably got more resource and they're a bit further ahead, so we need to be moving quickly to make sure that the case for composites is well made and it's supported by data. Uh, and Raphael's highlighted the, the eco-calculator as an important resource that's available free of charge for anyone to use, you know, to, to start generating relevant data. I can see Nicholas wants to, to come in there, so quickly to him, and then we're going to come to the audience. Yeah, thank you. Just a quick point on the importance of education. I think it has to do with also selecting the right technologies. Um, and, and to do that, you need to really get under the hood and understand the pros and cons of each. Um, and, and, you know, I say that the market is huge, and, and we as Continuum have, have a target of building say six factories in Europe, that's gonna be 250,000 tons. There are many, many times that amount that need to be recycled in Europe. We need multiple technologies uh, and we need them yesterday, of course. And, and the issue is if you don't do your homework and you select the wrong technologies, then are, those are not gonna be long lasting, right? So that means that in 10 years, 15 years, the majority of people will not have access two real technologies, they're still gonna be landfilling or burning their waste, and that's a problem, and that's a threat to the industry. Okay, with that thought, uh, let's hand it over to the audience. I'm just looking to see where the roving microphone might be. Um, I'm looking in vain at the moment. Uh, we have a hand up at yep. the back over there. Um, do you wanna stand up? And uh, in the absence of a mic, uh, do you want to shout out loudly what your question is so we can hear? Sorry, I think you're going to have can't. to come to the front because we can't really hear you. Oh, here comes the mic. You've, you're saved from walking up to the front. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Yusa from GK and Aerospace. I would like to thank you guys for a really interesting talk. Um, so I've got a paragraph here that's quite like to hear your thoughts. Um, so the circular economy requires a whole system design approach, which is multidisciplinary, um, that provides social, e economic, and environmental sustainability. Can you please highlight the importance of internal cross-functional um, collaboration within companies um, and regional with, across partners um, and across regions and globally to create a circular economy, um, a circular economy, um, globe, a global circular economy for composites. Okay, that's great. I think, I think we got the, 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 the question. Or the point that was being made is that um, uh, to create a global circular economy needs a lot of partnership uh, cross-functionally with between organizations, between sectors. So uh, I'm looking for a volunteer to, to pick that one up first. Anyone want to respond to that need for sort of collaboration? And maybe with an example of how it's worked already. 
So Raphael has put his hand up. Yeah, I would like to just to give you a, an example. Uh, with uh, at the moment, we are collaborating with different end users within Europe, EBI, which is the European Boat Industry, and same, and, same bureau and different uh, manufacturers, raw material manufacturers, how to address the problem. So we have already started this dy dynamic almost a year ago, and now we are starting to have a, a different topics to address. One of them is to go to the, the, authority, the authorities sorry, and to have a waste code definition because we really need this to address and different pragmatic uh, actions. So it's a live example, but yes, we need to be together to address the problem. Yeah. That's great. Across thank you for, for highlighting that. And I think, Tim, you want to uh, highlight an example as well. Yeah, thank you for that question. So exactly this is needed. So cooperation, what I said. So we need to understand that now the typical waste disposal companies are the future raw material supplier. So they need to cooperate with the production industries who are producing the um, virgin material, which can be subsidized by recycled material. So they need to understand what is the need. And this was totally separated in the past. So it means um, having access to the requirements and to the border lines where we can achieve the same results or where the border lines to achieve the results um, it was recycled carbon fiber material, it was not clear. It was just like an expectation of having the same quality, but with less price. So this is far not enough, and this is not the aim and the potential of thinking about sub sustainability, from my understanding. We need to have testing in place. We need to have a standardized uh, testing environment where we can compare different recycled materials. So this is, from my understanding, also a very big need. So these are, these are kind of ideas where companies need to work together, sitting together at the table, having an open discussion. And the last point was already highlighted, so the framework is not clear. And let me just give you a short explanation from practical work. So same waste, same waste code from Austria, we can collect on a green list. Same waste code, same material from Poland is hazardous waste material to ship in. So we have a big problem, we have a not solved framework, and this is what we need to address to the EU, that we have a common understanding that even in some areas, landfill for composite materials is allowed. So I guess this is what needs to be solved. So thanks for that question. Thank you, Tim. And Nicholas, you want to add to that? Yeah, I want to piggyback on what you said, Rafael, because I think you picked two really good industries. You picked wind and you picked boats. And wind is, you know, they have a very urgent problem to solve, right? They've been promising this green energy for 20 some years and now the blades are coming or the turbines are coming to end of life and somebody needs to do something with them. Um, and it's, it's also a really nice source of feedstock, if you will, because you, you know where the turbines are, you know who owns them, um, you know when the end of life is, it's very pre predictable in that sense. Boat is a different story because you have millions and millions of boats across Europe, uh, but they're all laying somewhere. And additionally, you have, you know, say, the person who bought the boat first paid the most amount of money for it. And then 30, 40 years later, the boat that, the person that bought the boat is the one that can least afford a recycling solution. But you need to start. And so you have wind, which can help you start to get the volumes into the market so that you can establish you know, and incentivize the players. You talked about logistics, but you need more logistics. You need more blade cutting in the sense of, in the sense of or the, the example of wind. And then you'll start to get the standards that will make recycling efficient. And then you'll be able to pull the boats in. And then you'll be able to, to pull even you know, the, you, you have fiberglass in your circuit boards. Right? But those get sent somewhere to be burnt, and then you reclaim the precious materials. But there is a ton of waste that you can get from a circuit board. Uh, but it's only once you make that efficient that you can then get access to those sources of feedstock. So. That's great. Thanks for adding that. John, final comment from you, and then we'll go to another audience question. So the things that are getting pointed out is that there's not one size fits all. You know, it's going to really be different for each product that's out there and the marketplace that it sits in. So whether it's a boat, whether it is a, uh, an electrical utility pole, um, whether it is a bridge deck, um, you know, from years on out, they're all going to have different solutions. But 
I think what we're going to have to be cognizant, not one size fits all. Yep, I think that message I hope has come across very clearly that we need multiple solutions for the complexity of the challenge that we've got. So yes, we've got a question in the middle. Yes, Stella Job here from um, Graysbrook Innovation. Um, some of you know who I am. <laughs> um, I think about re composite recycling a lot. Um, and one of the things that's been going through my mind recently is that we need to change the mindset. We need to stop thinking about the problem of end of life waste. And we need to start thinking about how to valorize end of life products, how to increase asset value of end of life products. So uh, I think one of the really important things that we need to see, as Tim mentioned, is getting the European Code of Waste list uh, for composite waste, because it's not measured now. Um, but I'd like to ask mainly Tim and Nicholas, what can designers and manufacturers do to valorize um, their, their products for end of life in terms of the recycling, recyclability? Okay. So how can we valorize you know, products at end of life? I think Tim and Nicholas, do you want to start? Uh, Nicholas, do you want to start on that one? Uh, and then we'll see if there are others in the panel. I think Stefan wants to come in on that as well. Um, you know, as I said, I think the, the best way to create value is to turn these materials into useful products. But as we know, that's, that's a tough thing to do because you have multiple pieces of the puzzle that you have to solve. You have to, you have to solve the feedstock problem, you have to solve the technology problem, and then you have to solve the product problem. Um, and, and that's tough. And companies don't start out with 100 people, right? They start out with a couple of people working on something thinking, oh shoot, right, I can do this. Uh, and, and I can recycle something. And you have to, 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 to build that up, build those capacities and, and capabilities up. Um, but I, I think you have to always look at the products and the markets that you're going into uh, and make sure that, you know, ideally you can be competitive in terms of performance. That's a must. Um, now we know that sustainability is also critical. And then... It, you know, you have to be price competitive, or at the very least, you can't be three, four, five times the price of a competing product because nobody will buy you. Okay, that's great. Uh, Tim? Yeah, just a quick one. So I would also say we need to take care about this uh, uh, product uh, identification card, like a passport, because the beauty of composite material is we can produce it in hybrid structures. This is a unique of composite materials. means uh, the design for recycling might be very tough. Anyhow, this is a thing... We need to work on or the designers need to work on on the same stage i would say we can solve this probably as we know what is containing into this in in this parts by a product pass which is also under discussion from my understanding okay stefan yeah first thing is clear we need to think about recycling once we are designing um the part um the second thing is yeah you know you have to know what to do with the part or the material you get back and this is really critical because it's happening years later or probably you do not have the, the, the part yourself. Um, one thing is what we are participating in is a research project, a very huge research project with 40 or even more partners, the European project, where we have a platform, a digital platform that on the one hand gives you advices what to do with your waste material. On the other hand, it gives you an advice how to create something out of the waste material and the most important thing, it's closing the demand um, and the supply. So if someone has material, he can offer it on that platform. And uh, someone has a, um, needs the material, he can maybe find it. It's still under development. It, uh, it's called a DigiPrime platform. Maybe if someone wants to check this out. And um, we hope this will go online within the next year. And it will only work if all of us will participate to that. So, we need a critical mass on such a thing that it works. So everybody must use something like this, then it works. Okay, that's great. Thank you for highlighting that. And actually, I was just going to add that another thing that's important here is the idea of a, a passport, which actually captures the material composition information in a part. 
uh, which makes it easier then for anybody who inherits it uh, as part of waste collection to know what's in it and what to do with it. Uh, our clock has turned red, so we're going to have to, uh, to begin to wrap up there. I just want to ask each of the panelists one further question. I'm looking for a 10 to 15 second answer to each one of these, uh, from each of you, to this question. What one change would you like everyone in the audience here and everybody who watches the recording later, what one change would you like them to make to help increase the circularity of composites going forward? So I'll maybe come to Amayel first. If it's okay, I'll come back along the line. What one change would you like those in the audience to make? 10 second answer. Less than 10 seconds. Think lifetime extension. And that's the first way to go in order to reduce CO2 emissions. And uh, complementarity between all those solutions is key. So we need to work together. And this has been said uh, a lot already. OK, that's great. Think lifetime extension. Raphael. I would say stop comparing virgin material and recycled material. OK. See them as two different raw materials. Nicholas. Um, uh, I think we have to address the problem urgently uh, and we also have to address the problem practically with the solutions that exist today and then also knowing that we we plan for the future 10 20 30 years from now okay so act now use what's available now and then we develop from there john focus on the positive business case of utilizing the recyclate that comes from the composites that's great so business case and you know look at what we can do today Stefan. Um, make sustainability the most important requirement of your product, and the rest will be easy. <laughs> OK, there's a challenge. Make it the top priority. I would certainly endorse that. Tim. Light weight is the enabler for carbon dioxide reduction, definitely. And this will start at everybody from himself taking the own responsibility to make the right choice for the right material. OK. So a whole range of recommendations there that I hope are going to be helpful for you to take forward. Uh, so we're out of time. We could probably have spoken for another hour, but that's it for this year. I hope it's been really useful. Uh, I'd like to thank the JEC organization for allowing us to have this type of forum session. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, I hope you've all gained something from the conversation that you've listened in on. I'd like to thank each of the panel who have given their time today and their expertise to share with you their perspectives. And uh, said, my encouragement to you all is act now. You know, get on and start addressing the challenge now, uh, and we will move rapidly, therefore, as a market as a whole. But thank you very much for listening. Enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs>